Good morning. Welcome to the Brookings United Church of Christ. Good to see you, those of you who are uh, joining us in the sanctuary, as well as those who are joining us on Facebook Live this morning as well. So we just want to start our worship service this morning with uh, just a few announcements that Peggy's going to share with us at this time. I'm not Gary. <laughs> Uh, we are starting our first grief share of this year, th this evening. Uh, we will be every Sunday from 5.30 to 7.30 here at the church until or through November 17th. Uh, it is every session is self-supporting, so people are welcome to join at any time during that, uh, that period. Uh, don't forget to sign up for the backpack program, uh, August 26th at 5.30. The sign-up sheet is on the offering table. Farmer's Market, please sign up if you can help at the Farmer's Market. Uh, just a reminder, if you would like to support the church, the offering plate is back on the table. And you can also do ACH transactions or through tithely.com. Something to chew on on Wednesday evening begins at 6.30 with a potluck, lots of good food, and everyone's welcome to come. We have a really neat program afterward. Coffee and conversation, Tuesdays from 10.30 to 11.30 at the downtown location of Cottonwood Coffee. There again, good coffee, good people, good conversation, a lot of fun. Don't forget to turn in your hy V receipts. And we still have an opening for Sunday worship the last Sunday of the month. Please sign up if you can and ask the office if you're not sure what to do. Now, are there any other announcements? And none of that made Facebook Live, so we're just like, that was total silence, <laughs> so I'll just go ahead and say, um, yeah, that, uh, well, we'll talk about that more in, in joys and, and, and concerns. How's that? But um, there's a number of people uh, missing this morning who have been ill, and uh, you know, one of them was, in fact, uh, Lauren, but we thank you for like making it today and being here with us, and so I guess I'm going to help you get through a a couple of hymns here, right? So, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll do that and save, save your voice. Maybe you can do a centering song. All right, we'll see. <laughs> all right, well, let's uh, join. Uh, stand, if you would, if you're able this morning for the joining together of our praise song this morning. It's a, what a beautiful name.
standing for the call to worship this morning. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. Hear and believe the good news. We have been called as God's people. God has set up a covenant over and over again, choosing us even before we could choose, faithful even when we are faltering. In the wilderness, in exile, in certainty and doubt, abundance and scarcity, God's promise is true to the thousandth generation. We hear our names. We look up for our help. We know in our hearts. We love because God first loved us. We follow because God first came to us. We can be faithful because God is faithful. Come, let us worship our God together. Please take this moment to greet your neighbors this morning. And, and you may be seated. So this is our time, time in our worship service each week. We lift up joys and concerns. Um, and we have a lady, Peggy, with the microphone. And if you have something to share, she will find you this morning. So I would uh, just start out by saying again that we have several people who are ill. And uh, one... Technically, I uh, tested positive with, with COVID and uh, a number of others who have COVID-like symptoms but seem to not test positive, but testing negative. So I'm wondering if, <laughs> wondering if we have a different strain that maybe some of those tests aren't, aren't actually working on. But anyway, let's just, uh, yeah, uh, keep those who are not with us in our, in our prayers as well. Yes, let's keep Mona and Dave and Gary in our I also would like to have prayers for my neighbor Nancy, whom I've asked for prayers before. She's having extremely hard time with her vision all of a sudden, and they have possibly determined that she had at least one, if not two or more, mini strokes in her sleep one evening, which has caused her vision to uh, not be very good anymore and she's had a lot of weakness in her extremities so prayers for nancy please all right others yeah. uh, my sister is going to be giving birth to my nephew any day now so just prayers for that it's her first so all right. All right. Yeah, just pray name? that it goes smoothly what's, what's her name her name is danica danica others Lisa. Um, I want to be thankful for uh, Ruby and Jim bringing us fresh vegetables again this week. It looks like there's some again in the entryway. And for all the farmers and um, people who work in agriculture. And um, I just want to lift up, um, looking at the picture on the screen of the world and our world, um, and the people, especially in, in Israel, the people, uh, the Palestinian people, I was just so thankful last night for a hot shower. And I just think about all the people who have no home and have probably not had a shower in weeks or months. And it's just the little things that they just don't have. They don't have shelter or food or safety. Yes, and... Um... We need to continue to keep that conflict as well as the conflict in Ukraine in our um, thoughts. Thank you. I would like prayers for my sister-in-law, Wendy, who has just had um, a second hip replacement. She had hip replacement on her right side in December, and now she's had the second hip. After falling a number of times, she's had to have a second hip replaced. So she's, and she doesn't, 
she can't use crutches because her bones are so brittle. So she needs a lot of prayer. And go on. Well, I'm thinking about the resumption of school at all the levels that'll be, you know, already started at SDSU and that'll be in this coming week. So prayers for educators and staff, administrators, coaches, bus drivers, their safety for, you know, everybody, everybody in those communities. Yeah, music majors, right? <laughs> including our own Lauren, others. All right. If there are no others, let's come to the Lord in a moment of silent prayer, and I will lead us into the Lord's Prayer. Gracious God, I lift up all of the, the joys and concerns that were mentioned uh, to you in the sanctuary as well as those you've received through the power of your Holy Spirit, God. Specifically, we, we pray for all the, the continuing conflicts around the world, um, Lord, when acts of violence are, are met with acts of violence and uh, and the eye for an eye and the tooth for a tooth continues to be the the preferred method of seeking justice and and yet, Lord, um, all violence um, brings upon itself is more violence. And so, Lord, we just pray for wisdom for those uh, who are in positions of, of power, um, both governments as, as well as those who are the leaders of terrorist organizations. Lord, we just pray that your um, spirit would come upon them and and lead them to a resolution, uh, Lord, a cessation of the, of, of the violence. Because, Lord, we know that ultimately um, it, it doesn't solve uh, any, any, anything. It just begets more of the same. So, Lord, in the midst of that, though, in the, in the midst of um, death and destruction, Lord, we still have the promise of, of new life when we, when we hear of new ones who have just come into the world or coming into the world, Lord, it gives us a, a hope um, for the future of a humanity that can continue to grow in um, wisdom and knowledge and, um, and to move closer to your likeness, God. We, we pray for that day. And um, in doing so, we also lift up those um, who are uh, formally continuing to, to learn Lord, both uh, elementary age, high school age, and in and, and college, and so we lift up those educators and those who are seeking uh, to learn as well. And so in all of these things, God, we just pray your presence and, uh, and, your, and your guidance as we pray together the, the prayer that you taught your disciples as we, contempor- as we say together a contemporary form of this prayer. Our Creator God, who reigns in heaven, Holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So at this time, let's sing together hymn number 292, Breathe on Me, Breath of God.
Now let's join together in our unison prayer, both in your bulletins as well as on the screens before us this morning. Holy and Almighty God, with the apostles, we live in the afterglow of the resurrection celebration. Like them, we too have fears and doubts. We want to believe with all our hearts the story we have heard. But so often daily life gets in the way of our faith. Help us, O God. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to walk through each day's obstacles so that we see them not as causes for doubt, but barriers to be lifted by faith. Lord of resurrection surprises, open our hearts this day to the presence of Christ. Erase our excuses for unbelief and exchange them for strong witness to the power of your mercy and love. Give us courage and challenge us to walk the path of discipleship, knowing that Jesus goes before us, leading and guiding our steps. So, if I cannot always sense your providence, if I do not always feel confident about my faith, if I wonder where your love is in the face of pain and death, I am not the first. A great company of saints and martyrs has felt this way before me. But now in your presence, they see face to face and know as they are known. Teach us all, like them, not so much to fear doubt as to see it as a sign of the mystery of life and a door to discovery. In the holy and precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And so, are you up to this, Lauren? (laughs) We'll see. We'll see. Okay. Well, this is a song uh, that was going to be sung by uh, Lauren, but now she will uh, (laughs) play it. And if you know this uh, song, uh, it's entitled, though, Raise a Hallelujah.
Well, as you were playing that, Lauren, I was just imagining your beautiful voice actually singing the lyrics to that song. So, and then the lyrics to that song did, did tie into uh, where I'm uh, going with this message to, today. So, uh, you know, if you have a cell phone when you leave and you want to pull that song up on your phone and, and listen to it, but thank you for, for leading us in that. So the scripture I'd like to share with you all today, I have uh, two um, the first one is the gospel from the Gospel of John. It's chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. In the New Living Translation, it says this. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Come, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Philip went to look for Nathaniel and told him, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathanael. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Philip replied. As they approached, Jesus says, said, Now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. How do you know about me? Nathanael asked. Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Then then Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. Jesus asked him, Do you believe this just because I told you I had seen you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. Then he said, I tell you the truth, you will all see heaven open, and angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man, the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. So our second scripture comes from the Gospel of John, also chapter 20, verses 24 through 29. In the New International Version, it says this. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So this morning I'm in a four-week series I've entitled The Apostles of Jesus, in which I'm examining the lives of Jesus' first disciples to see what insights we might gain from their lives in an effort for us to become more effective modern-day disciples. And as, as I've noted in prior sermons, we have a somewhat limited biblical reference to some of these first disciples, but we're able to gain a greater insight through centuries of church tradition. And in exploring some of that tradition, I've been consulting two, two books, The Search for the Twelve Apostles by Stuart McBurney and The Thirteen Apostles by J. Ellsworth Callis. So today we'll be looking at the disciples uh, named Philip, Thomas, and Nathaniel slash Bartholomew, a, a dual name which I'll unpack shortly. But as I'm preaching, this is a a five-week series. I had to decide which three men to put together for two of these sermons. So as I read again the biblical accounts of of these men, I began to see a common theme. It seems to me that all three were men of real faith who had moments of real doubt as well. And So this started me thinking about how we today in our society how we decide what to believe. In the era of 
fake news and fake diets and fake investments and the list goes on and on. How do we decide what is real and true? So I came across this illustration about a defendant who was on trial for murder. So there was strong evidence indicating guilt, but there was no corpse. So uh, a lawyer for the defendant, knowing that his client would probably be convicted, he resorted to a trick. He said, within one minute, the person presumed dead in this case will walk into this courtroom. And he looked toward the courtroom door. The jurors were somewhat stunned. They all looked on eagerly. A minute passed. Nothing happened. Finally, the, the lawyer said, Actually, I made up the previous statement, but you all looked in anticipation. I therefore put it to you that there is reasonable doubt as to this case whether anyone was killed at all, and I insist you re return a verdict of not guilty. The jury, clearly confused, retired to deliberate. A few minutes later, the jury returned and pronounced a verdict of guilty. But how, inquired the lawyer, you must have had some doubt. I saw all of you stare at the door. The jury foreman replied, oh, we looked, but your client didn't. So much of what we believe or doubt in terms of our humanity comes from what we know about human nature. But we, what, what we believe or doubt about spiritual matters is not as straightforward. What those original disciples had was the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, which prophesied a Messiah to come sometime in the future. And in addition to that, we today have a New Testament, which tells us that the Messiah who did come and lived among us some 2,000 years ago still lives among us today. But just like the disciples were discussing today, we are a people of faith who sometimes have momentary doubts surrounding the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. So let's look at the lives of these three men and what they believed, along with an honest assessment of their doubts. Let's begin with this character named Philip. Now, Philip was born in Bethsaida on the northeast corner of the Sea of Galilee, as were many of the other disciples. He was a Jew, but his name was Greek. We don't know for sure why his parents gave him a Greek name instead of a Jewish one but it could likely have been in honor of Philip, the, the Philip who was the governor of the region. That Philip was the best of the sons of Herod the Great, who, who made Bethsaida the capital of the province and brought so many benefits to the area during his long and peaceful reign. And then when the disciple Philip came into manhood, he affiliated himself, as did Andrew, Peter, James, and John, with this new preacher of righteousness, John the Baptist. In fact, he became a disciple of Jesus just a day after these other men. Our scripture tells us, the, it says, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip 
and said to him, come, follow me. And then it says, Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Nazareth. The son of Joseph, excuse me, from Nazareth. So we might assume from this passage that Philip had heard the stories about Jesus, but had not previously met him before his calling. The scriptural witness to Philip, other than the lists of the disciples, is limited to this, as well as three other stories from the Gospel of John. In each of them, his faith is tempered by a hint of doubt. First is in the story known as the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus asks Philip a question to test him. He says, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? To which Philip responds, six months' wages would not be enough to buy bread for each of them to get a little. And then there's the story of when a group of Greeks come searching for Jesus. And he doubted whether or not he should take them directly to Jesus. So Philip went to Andrew to ask him what he thought. And then finally, at the last supper, supper during the farewell discourse, Jesus says to all the disciples, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. To which Philip then responded, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. So here again, his faith was intertwined with this thread of doubt as to what Jesus was saying. But as we move on to look at this character of Nathaniel, his doubt was on display even before he met Jesus. Now just a, a, a quick word about his name, which I said that I would, would rever- reference. Like a few of the other disciples, he was known by two names. In the first three Gospels, he's called Bartholomew, but in the Gospel of John, he is called Nathaniel. So Bartholomew is not a first name, it's an identifying name, which literally means son of Ptolemy. So having explained that, let's continue with this this call story. After Philip told Nathanael of Jesus' hometown, our scripture says that Nathanael replied, Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? So after Philip says, come and see for yourself, Nathanael encounters Jesus, who says to him, Now here is a genuine son of Israel, man of complete integrity. To which Nathanael responds, How do you know about me? Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. And then Nathanael exclaims, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. So it's interesting uh, to me how quickly sometimes our doubts can disappear when the things we think are impossible actually come about. So example, an example of this is um, some of the, the following statements that are actually taken from official documents, newspapers, and magazines widely read during their day. So listen to what these authorities of these times had to say. 1840, anyone traveling at the speed of 30 miles per hour would surely suffocate. 1878, electric lights are unworthy of serious attention. 1901, no possible combination could be united into a practical machine by which men shall fly. 1926, from a scientist. This foolish idea of shooting at the moon is basically impossible. 1930, another scientist. To harness the energy locked up in matter is impossible. And of course, it's impossible for a man to be resurrected in a new form of a body after being dead for three days as well. And this is what our third disciple Thomas, where he comes in to to the story in our second scripture, the name, his name Thomas, is actually derived from 
the Aramaic word Toma, meaning twin. And our scripture says he was also known as Didymus, which is the term for twin in Greek. So it's likely that he was born as a twin, and these were both nicknames, actually, because a parent would be unlikely to give one of two babies a formal name of twin. But we in modern Christianity have given him yet another nickname, Doubting Thomas. And even before the account of today's scripture, it seems that he earned that nickname. There are two other stories in the Gospel of John where Thomas is mentioned. One is when Jesus says he's going to the return to the home of his dead friend Lazarus. And at this point, Jesus' own life is under threat. And so Thomas says to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now at first glance, this might sound like a somewhat heroic statement, but it's likely that Thomas was, what he was really saying here in essence was, everything's lost anyway. Let's just go and join dead Lazarus. Thomas had faith in Jesus, but was doubting the outcome of his mission. Then just a few days later, during the Last Supper, Jesus tells all of the disciples he he will be going away to prepare a place for them, which he concludes by saying, and you know the way to the place where I'm going. To this, Thomas replies, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? So here we see Thomas's faith seeking understanding. But in the absence of his understanding, doubt begins to creep in. And the same thing can happen to us with tragic effects if we don't recognize it for what it is. Of course, you all know that Billy Graham passed away several years ago. But you might not know the story of his longtime friend and associate, Chuck Templeton. Chuck worked with Billy Graham in Youth for Christ in the early days of his ministry, and he helped organize Youth for Christ in Canada. But over time, Chuck Templeton became an agnostic and renounced his faith in Christ. He left the ministry and and managed two of Canada's leading newspapers. Then Lee Strobel, now a pastor in Houston, was formerly an investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune. He had received his attorney's degree at that time and was himself a committed agnostic. But through his wife's influence on the Willow Creek Church in the Chicago area, Lee came to a personal faith in Christ and has subsequently written several books upholding the Christian faith. But Lee happened to read one of Chuck Templeton's books entitled, Farewell to God, My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian Faith. So he decided to fly to Toronto to meet Chuck Templeton, then 83 years old, and interviewed him. And in their interview, Chuck Templeton vigorously defended his agnostic rejection of a God who claimed to love yet allowed suffering around the world to go unchecked. Then toward the end of their time together, Strobel asked Templeton point blank how he felt about Jesus. Instantly, Templeton softened. He said, in my view, he's the most important human being who has ever existed. And then his voice began to crack. And he haltingly said, I miss him. And Templeton's eyes filled with tears, and he wept with his shoulders shaking. What a contrast of two friends. Billy Graham and Chuck Templeton. They once worked together for the Lord, and then went on their separate journeys. Billy Graham said that Jesus was his most prized possession, while Chuck Templeton wept for having left him years ago. How quickly his doubts 
and our doubts would be thwarted. If we could only encounter Jesus the way that Philip and Nathaniel did in their calling, and Thomas finally did at Jesus' resurrection. But there's an interesting parallel between these two stories in today's Scripture. In our first Scripture, Jesus tells Nathaniel something impossible for him to know, to which Nathaniel responds, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. And then Jesus asks him, do you believe this just because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? And then our second Scripture, after Thomas sees the holes in Jesus' hands and Side, he says, my Lord, my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. None of us today will ever encounter Jesus the way that these three disciples did. And yet even they had their doubts. But may we emulate the faith that they had in the midst of their doubts. And may we encounter our resurrected Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit in different and unique ways that will squelch the doubt the evil one whispers in our ear while opening us up to the truth of the impossible. Amen. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, with our limited human capacities and and, and intellect, um, Lord, we sometimes question uh, our faith and, and who you are, God, and even the existence of you when we see the suffering in, in the world, um, Lord, and when we read stories of um, miracles in, in the Gospels, including the resurrection of Jesus, Lord, sometimes we doubt. and Sometimes we don't believe until we can actually see. But Lord, what we see sometimes is through a mirror, dimly. And we don't have the whole picture Lord. So Lord, in our moments of of doubt, Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would uh, remind us of our our human limitations and frailty. And God, remind us just even within our own human experience of, of those times when the things that we thought were impossible as human beings, that we actually accomplished as human beings. And so how much more of the impossible can exist in you and through you, God? Help us to walk in faith and to raise a hallelujah for your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. And so at this time, if you would stand once more, if you are able, uh, as Lauren plays and I lead us in singing our closing hymn, uh, number 42, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing.
receive the benediction. As you go from this place, may the doubts that you have turn to promise and may your voice be raised in a thousand tongues to sing the praises of our God and King. Go in peace and serve the Lord.